Tommy boy. How are you, my friends? Mate, I'm very good. Uh, not to get too deep too quickly, but I'm actually in the country two and a half hours away from Gold Coast. Um, I'm by myself because my lovely other half is down in Melbourne at the moment. Um, I saw that. She's doing workshops, yeah? She's doing workshops. Yeah, she's doing workshops. Yep. So it's just me and the dogs in the middle of nowhere reading uh, some, some, some deep shit about death and dying and the meaning of life. And uh, oh to be honest with you, mate, you want- I can't help but feel a little to- bit out of whack with the world. So it's interesting. <laughs> wow. Do you want me to provide a, a minder for you at all? Are you okay there? Uh, yeah, no, things, be, things are a little strange. Uh, things are a little strange. No, I'm totally fine, mate. Talk to me about yourself. How you how you rolling at the moment? I'm just a phone call away, Tommy. Just remember that, okay? <laughs> You're never there when I need you the most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, mate. As uh, mentioned uh, in our last interview, we've gone back to back. Uh, and the, the weather is just spectacular mm. in Melbourne right now. So how did those storms go in Queensland, BT Dubs? Yeah, they were pretty interesting. We, we actually drove back from Toowoomba uh, in it and um, the rain was torrential. We got two beagles, which is a beautiful segue into um, – what we're going to be talking a lot about today um but uh one of them has a little bit of attachment stuff going on so um Siobhan couldn't wait to get home for her but um they were pretty insane northern brisbane got hit the most um but certainly yeah, right. big issues in, in in gold coast as well so yeah. yeah well now that we've gotten past the weather uh <laughs> today, today we have <laughs> really great guest on the show uh his name is jordan wiseman and uh i'm, I'm just going to provide a little bit of a, uh, a discussion on what his background is and what he's currently doing so um jordan's an accredited canine behavioralist and a trainer and he's the founder of chilled and fulfilled great name mm. children fulfilled are driven by their motto teaching people transforming dogs and are determined to improve the lives of humans and their dogs through an education in canine psychology, communication, leadership. Uh, Jordan's interest in dog training began in 2011 when he adopted his first dog who came with a range of behavioural issues. Jordan has been working with dogs professionally since 2021 and primarily works with older dogs and behavioural issues such as pulling and leading uh, pulling and leading on walks, uh, overexcitement, aggression, persistent barking, destructive behaviour and separation anxiety, to name a few. Last year, Jordan resigned from the police force after nine years to pursue a career as a canine professional in a pet dog space. He is loving his new life and uh, the challenges that come with running a business uh, for the first time. Jordan has an Instagram channel and we'll talk all about that uh, in a little while. Um, he's depicted as many dogs. He works uh, with before and after training and has generated over half a million views in the last nine months. That's awesome. sick, Jordan. Well done. Mm, mate. That's amazing. And welcome, and welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? I'm great. Uh, so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, very excited to dive in and, uh, you know, in the, I'm going to guess, 35 years that you've been on this earth, uh, is that around right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. 35 years you've been able to achieve so much uh, in a number of different uh, careers already professionally. Of course, we are greater than uh, what our careers are, but let's just, you know, you've developed and evolved so much in that in the police force and you you've developed also the courage to be able to uh be pulled by a different passion and calling which is now a good pun um, very good pun <laughs> i missed it i to tell me pulled in a in a pulled different right direction right. he uh, was barking to get there you know <laughs> <laughs> and you're now you're now walking working as a canine behavioralist working with uh uh you know pet owners as well as a dog owners. And I would imagine a lot of the uh, interaction that you have is with humans themselves as well, to be able to break down barriers and perceptions of what it is to, to have, have a dog, but um, welcome. And I just wanted to uh, really just congratulate you on uh, realizing that calling and stepping into your new reality. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, 
Yeah, it does. It felt like a really challenging decision um, to leave a job that I that I loved. I uh, really enjoyed uh, working with the police, and I'd also just um, in the year before I resigned, or in the twelve months before, um, I just landed like my my dream job there. So mm. it, that and it was such a great place to work, good office, good work culture. And, um, and then, yeah, I just, there was this other thing kind of ticking away on the side, uh, my engagement with dogs and helping people. And, um, I was just faced with a really hard decision and what made it so hard was actually how much I was enjoying my other work as well. Mm. Uh, so, so yeah, but, but it, it was a good decision and I'm, I'm loving it. Haven't looked back. I just want to drill down really quickly on because so many people I would feel have been in the exact same position that you've been in where they've had a culturally uh, thriving existence in a role that they've had or let me actually rephrase that they've probably had a uh, probably not such a positive experience in their current role and they've had something calling them hypothetically theoretically in their minds but they haven't been able to uh take that next step what gave you that 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 courage to step into your new reality even though you had such a like a what appears to be a positive experience where you were well that's a great question paul and i i think there was there's, there's a few parts to that the first thing is um I actually needed to take a break from my work. Um, I was working at the sexual crime squad in the major crime division, so dealing with um, some pretty serious day-to-day work. Um, And even before that, you know, had worked in the domestic violence uh, high-risk investigations. So I it came to a point where I needed to take um, some time off work just to look after myself. And... It was in that time that I actually asked myself, what is it that I want my life to look like? And the reason I asked myself that question, one is because I gave myself space to do that. When I was at work and just showing up and, you know, doing the thing, it's very, I'm not having those thoughts. I'm like, I was just in the machine of just going to work, coming home and doing the thing. and. Um, so yeah, so so having some space, so having some time off work was very helpful for me to really stop and like pause and take a look at my life, take a backward step. Um, and and whilst that was happening, even perhaps before that was happening, I just had this side passion, this side joy of helping people with dogs, and that was ticking along, and I was thoroughly enjoying it so much that I was like spending all my spare time doing that. Um, so whilst that was going on, I realized I've got this thing, I've got this skill set um, that, that I'm really enjoying spending time doing. Um, and on, at the same time, I'm reflecting on what do I want my life to look like? And it was really an exercise of like, if I could choose now how much money I earn, if I could choose how much time I spend at work, how much time I spend with my family, um, how much time I spend on myself. What opportunities do I want for myself, for my family, for the community? Um, can I create that in the job that I'm in? And that exercise was super helpful because it became obvious to me that whilst I had stability, I had a job that I loved, which I realize a lot of people, that's that's not their reality. Um, and that's like, you know, a privilege and and something that i you know, I, I really has always been at the forefront of my life is just do things that you love. Um, and, but, but I did feel that like when I did that exercise, there's actually a lot of limitations in the stability mm-hmm. and that in order to create the life that I wanted and the lifestyle that I wanted and the freedoms that I wanted, then I needed something had to change. So I had this thing that I was doing, uh, and I was really just, you know, testing the waters in the professional space. I was, I was actually spent when I started doing this. Um, I was just like working for free or as like a pay as you please, because I really just wanted to make sure that 
I was, um, you know, that I could actually, I just wanted to get more and more experience. And if you offer a service for pay as you please, people take you up on it. Mm. And that, and I just saw that like time after time I was getting results for people and their dogs. And I was like, I think I can do this and I want to formalize my qualification and I want to take this seriously. So it feels on the outside, like a really big, brave step, but honestly, internally, I feel like the way that I, I made the, it was very conscious. It was like, I'm going to do this on the side. I'm going to get educated. I'm going to get experience and I'm going to, you know, slowly build it up. And then when I feel like I'm at a point where, you know, there's interest in my services enough, then that helped me make that decision. So what I feel like is the brave decision. I see these people who are like, I'm unhappy in my job. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm leaving that for me, that is brave, but I didn't do that. Um, and maybe that's, that's just my own, I don't know. That's just my own thoughts about it. But I, this was, it was considered um, and it was a hard choice, but I just don't feel like it was a brave one. <laughs> mm. and, he, and he's humble too, Paul. What do we do? What do we do? He's a package. <laughs> he's a package. <laughs> that's he's awesome, married. man. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So, how about we um, we dive right in, right? So, you're a um, you're a canine behavioural specialist. Um, this is an area that that I'm really interested in for personal reasons obviously we've got two beagles we had a third who was a palliative um kind of end of life dog and he and he passed um and uh, and for professional reasons as well because i'm studying psych and i work as a counselor um straight off the bat i've got an assumption that i'd love for you to speak on for me um i'm going to be asking very kind of selfish questions here and i hope they apply to everyone listening <laughs> but uh if they don't well fuck you guys it's my show <laughs> so as as a as a um as a as a mammal myself, what are the similarities um in in um you know teaching dogs good behavior as well as um you know just developmentally for human beings too? Mm, that's a good question. Um I actually think with and I'm not I'm not avoiding this question because they learn in a very similar way, but it's actually most helpful to understand how dogs are different. Because the, the underlying problem that people face when they're challenged with dogs with behavioral problems, the common theme is that they relate to their dog in the way that they would relate to a human. Right. So the assumption is that this is how humans learn um, and therefore this is how my dog is going to learn. But there's a few key differences and when we, you understand those key differences, it actually makes an immense you, you, your capability of communicating with your dog and achieving results and behavioral change just that that just opens up mm. so the first thing is to understand that dogs and humans are actually different animals with different needs and the most i always start my the first session with a client with i talk about dogs or animals and that's important for two reasons um one is the simple fact that they're not a human and it's unhelpful for you to your dog to view them as a human. Yes, they're a family member, absolutely. Um, but often this lens of it's almost like just a, a, a baby with, with fur. And, um, but that's unhelpful for, for your dog. So the, the other thing about kind of the, the dogs or are, dogs are animals is that they are beautifully present animals are present and in the way that we're all now trying to be we're all just trying to not focus on the future and not dwell in the past we're just always trying to be present trying to be present you know there's this like i feel like there's like a cultural wave of being present you know? mm -hmm. so dogs are the most incredible example of like being present they are whilst they can predict things and they can remember things they live in the moment they are always seeking to benefit themselves in that moment they're just doing what feels right for them in that moment and we can shape what feels right for them we can shape and influence their behavior and their choices but it's important that we understand our ability to communicate with them about a specific behavior that they're doing exists in the moment that they're doing it or within depending on the studies, uh, one to 1. 1.4 seconds. 
that's a really short window to communicate with your dog or or an animal. Mm. Um, It's very short. And so when we understand that and we really practice that, all of a sudden, if we come home, you know, you come home and your dog's been destructive. People see the destruction and then they look at their dog who happens to be laying in the corner (laughs) and then the dog looks at them and then does this, right? Their dog like avoids confrontation. And then the human interpretation is guilty. You know exactly what you've done. You don't normally behave like this. And then they go and punish the dog. The problem is that's not what's going on for the dog. The dog is in the moment, right? So the dog has destroyed your furniture for whatever reason. Maybe they're under-exercised, under-fulfilled, um, you know, or maybe they've got some other, there's some other cause for that. And then you come home and your dog observes you, that your dog has, dogs have been living with us for 40,000 years. You know, we've, we've taken wolves, we've domesticated them, they've evolved into all these different breeds to do these jobs, but they have thrived living with humans and they are experts at reading body language. Mm. And they mm. see you come into the room and your behavior shifts from this relaxed state to tense, frustrated. It, internally, they know what's going on. And then they avoid that confrontation. They're like, shift in energy. Your energy is intense. I want to avoid confrontation. This is a dog being yeah. sensitive. And then we interpret that in a human sense of that's what a guilty person would do. Mm. And then we punish the dog. Now, what are we punishing the dog for? Whatever they're doing in that moment, which mm. is often just relaxing, that creates confusion. That creates resentment, frustration. It damages the relationship. Mm. So learning, so that's just one example. That's That's a great example. Communicate with your dog in the moment and letting everything else go is super important and a great gift that dogs give to you, the practice of being present. Like when I'm with my dog and I'm working with my dog, it's like there's nothing else going on. And Mm. if I miss that moment, that's it. I miss the moment to reward it or I miss the moment to to um correct the behavior or manage the behavior. It's it's gone. So it's it's a beautiful, beautiful practice. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. That's really awesome. And uh <laughs> it certainly uh, exposes a couple of loopholes for me. And even as you're talking, like, you know, it, it I know I mean this happened 48 hours ago. I came home from a run and Abby had gotten into uh the bin. And they were, just, they were just loving it. There was half an avocado in there and we didn't the full avocado, but, you know, they were, they, were, they were licking some of the remnants of it. And I did. And I you interpret that behavior. And we got another one, Archie, who who looked guilty to me. Yeah. But even just in hearing you talking there, it's a it's a very obvious reminder that humans, uh, we, we can think abstractly and we can think about the future and we can think about the past, you know, and they they can't do that. You know, and and for me to, um, it does bring up a little bit of guilt if I'm being honest with you. To you know, oh. just to kind of s- smite that behavior or go, what are you guys doing or whatever it was. Um, so all right, so so then as an alternative, then if you're saying you've missed the moment to correct that behavior, mm. in that situation, would it have been something where I just um, treat them um, as I love them, which is obviously what I do, and then just pick up the rubbish from the bin as though it was an irrelevant thing? Or So what we need to, to think of um, is what, firstly, how can we take responsibility for this? Sure. So when our dog is doing, um, dogs are doing what, uh, dogs are doing the best with the information and the guidance and leadership they have, much like humans. So, you know, and, you know, going back to, you know, police days, um, everyone's doing the best with the upbringing and the information they have. Mm-hmm. So dealing with like underprivileged kids and, all, and you know, the, the sorts of things that they would get up to, there's really like, when I, when I thought about it, it was very much like, if I was in your shoes, I'd be doing the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. There's like, so I, I feel we really, that, that sense of like empathy as well is so important to have with our dogs. And, you know, sometimes we hold dogs to too high of an expectation. Even as a dog trainer, I, I make this mistake, um, you know, just forgetting sometimes, even though my dog is amazing, she does make mistakes. She makes bad decisions because 
she's 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 an animal she's totally she's an animal so coming back to your question um how can we retake responsibility for this so you've got scent hounds you've got um dogs that will forage and dogs are creative and they're incredible at finding things so really we need to create a safe environment for them when they're left on their own Mm -hmm. If you just like we would with uh, with my uh, I have with my toddlers, I have locks on um, on certain cupboards where they could get things they could access that could cause them harm. I've now just as I'm saying this, um, I also want to say that the perspective in which I'm sharing is not one of like that uh, like there's I haven't made these mistakes. I yeah, have made. Yeah all of these mistakes in my, my last dog, um, had multiple surgeries from ingestion of foreign objects and was reactive. I didn't know how to deal with it. It was, it was a real, that was the start for me of just not knowing what to do. So all the mistakes that I'm teaching is from my own experience. Just, just wanted to, to say that. Well, that's Um, why I feel people would probably trust you though, you know, because you've been through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even now, like my dog who I've raised from a pup, she's, she's had, um, she made a really bad decision around a dog. You know, she lunged at a dog completely unjustified, unprovoked as far as I'm concerned. And now I'm having to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it was just like a great reminder that even with all the training and all the socialization and everything that I've done, she was like a fully off leash dog until a few days ago Mm -hmm. uh, where she made a decision that reminded me, yeah, I've got an animal, uh, a predatory animal that has the capacity to do serious harm. She's, she's a solid girl and I need to, I need to remember that and take the precautions um, that I need to, especially now that she's showing me those behaviors. Mm -hmm. So, so lock up your bins and your cupboards and make sure that like your dog is safe in the home. Um, Mm -hmm. And safe from making decisions that are going to cause them harm. Because if we, my, the brand is chilled and fulfilled, but really it's um, it's fulfilled and then chilled. That's kind of where it came from. It's like we we our dogs will relax and feel nourished and be their best selves when we fulfill them. Dogs that don't that aren't fulfilled uh, and those needs can change over the course of a dog's life. They um, they tend to make their own fun. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of up the, again, the onus is on the humans on how to meet their dog's needs. Choosing the right dog is really important. And so that our dog comes home and just switches off. Yeah. Mm. Uh, something just has popped up for me. Uh, cause I, I really kind of pictured myself in your position where you represent, uh, a, a position where people may aspire to, to to get to of education, being a, a dog trainer, being an educational uh, figure, and something like what happened with you and your your dog two days ago happened. Um, this is more from a curiosity psychological standpoint. Did you experience any form of um, vulnerability from a fr- from a position of education, saying? How could this happen? Absolutely. How could me being a representative of education happen? And the way that you were able to just allow me to uh, just say that the way you were able to just so fluidly uh, allow it to just kind of come through you uh, really uh, for for me, uh, I applaud you because it gives you a human aspect. It gives you and it gives us an understanding that, shit happens no matter who you are where you are and what type of person you are yeah look honestly that day which was really it's fresh you know it's uh i think it was friday it was mm. friday what is it it's, it's thursday now so just under a week ago that was like one of the worst days i've had in a really long time i was mm. i was like in tears that this happened um i was completely shocked like shocked by my dog's behavior. Um, it obviously, it caused a, a big scene. There wasn't any like serious injury to the other dog. Um, and it was lucky that the lead was on. I just don't, I didn't even usually have the lead on cause she's just, mm. I put her outside the shops, go inside. She, I come back, she waits outside. Um, um, and you know, she's just well socialized and everything, but 
yeah, I was just in complete and utter shock. And it was like heartbreaking as well that like the amount of time I've invested in this dog um, has been immense. And for that to happen and feel like, wow, straight away, just like muzzle training, um, mm, mm. You know, going now doing like a reactivity program with her, which I've taught many people. Now having to do that with my dog and I put so much work into prevention, it's full on, you know, like I can't, I spoke mm. to my mom about it. I spoke to my, my coach, um, my family and, and friends and, and other colleagues. Um, and, but I was just reminded and it was such a supportive process um, that one, uh, I, in sharing this with, with trainers, just hearing so many stories about, it's like, it's a pretty normal thing. Um, and again, I'm probably looking at it from an extreme perspective because that one incident is mean, means significant change for me. Whereas I think for most everyday people, it's like, it's easy to ignore or excuse. Oh, it's just an isolated incident. I just can't take that risk. So the good thing is, um, I just put the work into practice immediately and we just like she's she's been great like the last few days she's had lots of exposure to different dogs um she's just been totally fine so and the reality is it might just be a very isolated incident something i didn't see i don't know but it was very humbling and also a great reminder of like the risks of interacting of, of having a dog in an environment with other strange dogs um that you know there comes with that a whole lot of risk which mm. is why um, most, if not all dog trainers, uh, actually not all dog trainers, most dog trainers um, are not so fond of the off-leash dog parks. And yeah. but literally everyone, believe, every, when they think about getting a dog, certainly in my experience culturally, it's like get the dog, go to the park, let it run around with all the other dogs the best best time in your life. So that um, it from now, from my perspective, is like, comes with risk and is is actually not so good for your relationship with your dog. Mm. Jordan, just on that, I think. Oh, sorry, Paulie, go for it, man. No, you, go, you go, Tommy. Sorry, I'm I'm just uh, hanging on with everything here. <laughs> so I, I was. I think that's a really brilliant segue um, for uh, a discussion on what your thoughts are on a kind of you know a lot of cultural norms and obviously you mentioned one there being you know you just go to a dog park and let it socialize and let it run around i've heard that too that a lot of dog trainers that my partner siobhan follows and um uh, i follow as well are not a fan of that that thing at all so i'd love for you to touch on that and i'd also love for you to touch on two other things that i'm really interested that are coming up in the the canine zeitgeist so to speak um the 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 raw meat diet what, yeah. what your thoughts are on the 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 diet for for dogs, yeah, and also specifically um, Caesar, you know the 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 famous trainer Caesar's way of uh, training a dog with particular focus on the kind of the dominance hierarchy and how that perhaps con uh, con contrasts um, Victoria. I can't remember her last name, but less of a focus on the dominance hierarchy. And so, but yeah. yeah, could you touch on those three? I'm yeah, really yeah. interested. Sure, sure. So the first one was was cultural kind of cultural norms stuff about um, dog parks. So, mm. so yeah. So what, what was really interesting? Um, I actually recently did a seminar with um, with a trainer who's a background in uh, like working with zoo animals and and um, helping helping them. So it's um, definitely well educated in here. One of the one of one of the um really interesting things was a course on aggression. And one of the uh things that I, I certainly picked up was his when he was saying that in no other no place in in nature um does it exist where two animals um uh, like predatory animals, which a dog is even a domestic dog, uh, will give each other like eye contact and like walking towards each other in like when there's no family relationship between them and that not be a precursor to conflict. Yeah. I, I hope I've like uh, articulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Definitely. Two dogs, basically, when you walk down the footpath and there's a dog walking towards you, that scenario for your dog is 
totally normal for your for that to be a triggering situation for your dog. Yes. Because if your dog wasn't socialized, domesticated, da, 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 um, and this th- that just doesn't happen in the animal world. So so that was really that was like a really interesting mm. interesting perspective and a really like uh, quite um I felt clarifying for me because mm. My my understanding and from the education that I've had is certainly that like dogs dogs are, are pack animals, and they this is the environment they thrive in. But like, what is their pack? You know, and the pack is the is their family, is the the unit that they're spending the time with, where they're going on walks, they're doing activities. It's your family unit. So this idea that we're going to take our dog to a park with a whole lot of different animals of different sizes, different ages, different levels of socialization and have an expectation that they should all get along is just completely unrealistic mm-hmm. for the dogs and really for the humans as well. It's almost like imagine just a group of strangers meeting every day at the park, sometimes same people, sometimes different, and just having this expectation, go on, talk and run around and have fun. It just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I think it's really important to understand that and to know that your dog doesn't have to like every other dog. And that's true for all dogs. So if you're allowing your dog to go off lead in an environment with other dogs that are bigger than it, that may have other issues um, and may clearly like don't have to like your dog and may not like your dog, you're putting your dog at risk. There's yeah. a real risk mm. there, especially if you don't have excellent recall, if you don't have the ability to have control of your dog and stop your dog from approaching another dog. Because a dog that approaches another dog front on may trigger a, uh, a defensive response from that dog who is mm. not interested in interacting with you because I'm busy doing something else or I don't like the look of you. Mm. So, um, so I just want to like smash that one out of the water just from a, from your, like I see dog fights every day, every day, because I work in the proximity of parks and, um, it's, it's just, it's constant. And I feel sorry. It's, it's not, it's often not handled well. Um, you know, it takes an incident into a trauma if people don't know how to actually like respond to their dogs, it's often chaotic for the humans. Yeah. Really hard, really, really, um, really challenging. So, so that's it. And the other thing just on this is for those dogs that are going out there and, um, I, I do with the 4 PM crowd or even, even in the morning, you know, people think, Oh, I love my dog has so much fun at the dog park. Yeah. Great. They're running around. They're just doing whatever they want. Run here, run there, fetch the ball. And the humans generally will kind of just stand around and just kind of let their dog do the exercise. They're kind of outsourcing their exercise to the other dogs in the park with the, with the, the human mindset of that's um, my dog loves it. It's like, why wouldn't I give my dog that experience? They have so much fun. They come back tired, win for me, win for them. So my my response to that is if I asked your dog, because a lot of these people, a lot of the people who do that also come to me for support because their dog doesn't listen to them. Their dog doesn't come back when called. Their dog steals balls, is destructive at home, barking, blah, 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 overexcited. Mm. Or um, so so my I say, well, if I were to ask your dog what the best part of their day is, what would it be? Oh, it'd be the dog park. I was like, great. And what do you have to do with that? nothing Mm. you're literally a taxi driver to your take your dog to the best time of their day away from you so the entire value is not actually in the relationship it's external to the relationship that's such a good point when your dog values the world more than you not only is your dog a risk of running away if they had the opportunity because why wouldn't they go to the party in the park they have twice a day or once a day or once every two days they're really unfortunate um so, so of course your dog's not listening to you. Why would they? What, what mm. ability do you have to motivate your dog to choose to come to you mm. when you're just holding a bickie in the hand and get a cut at? So my whole thing is like we start by restructuring the relationship so that you actually, your dog chooses to be with you 
when you have that, I'm not saying don't take your dog off, off, you know, to off late dog parks, period. It's like, it's, that's not the, the, the statement I'm making. I can take, yeah, well, up until, until recently, I could take Blossom to the park and I, I sit on the outskirts, like at some distance away. She has the choice to interact with those dogs or interact with me. And she's choosing to interact with me. And you see wow. this a lot with working dogs whether if their owner's got the ball, they're like laser focused, they're bred for that kind of partnership relationship. And they, they're predisposed to kind of that conditioned response. But, um, that is really when your dog chooses you over the environment, you have the ability to just ask your dog for what it is that you need. Come to me, need you to sit, need you to relax, whatever it is, but your dog's choosing you because you've invested in the relationship. And yeah. then, you have control, you have freedom and you get to give your dog everything. The best yeah. life. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, it's exciting. <laughs> Paulie, so, uh, I feel like I'm just uh, being really no, selfish no, no, here. We're, but, uh, we're only one, we're only one not in three questions. True. So what was, this, what was the second one? I forgot it. Yeah. So well, the, the things that we're playing with, playing around with now, are, um, uh, liver and, and raw meat as well. Oh, yeah, right. Um, diet. Yeah, we, and we've actually noticed a lot of behavioral uh, improvements. Um, and, you know, we've tried to really be very liberal with the fact that they are hound dogs and they are just going to smell like we're out in the country right now and there are hares and kangaroos everywhere, you know, all the time. And we're trying to, um, you know, recognize their genetic predisposition. You know, I don't want them to be a human being, you know. We, yeah. I, I, I want them to be a dog. I want them to be a beagle. Um but uh, we have noticed some real improvements with the with the raw food, um, and I was just wondering what your um, your take on was with with the raw food, and then also just with in terms of behavioural issues, seeing um, uh, making becoming more educated about the dominance hierarchy is kind of like the central theme to helping them with their behaviour. So yeah, yeah. So um, on the raw food stuff, um, my journey with raw food started with my first dog. He came with, as soon as we got him, he was, took him to the vet. He's got dermatitis. Yeah. Um, ulcers in his paws was pretty bad. Not, it's quite, quite common to have skin problems in bulldogs. Um, anyway, it was, a we just were constantly taking him to the vet. Raw food, uh, sorry, prescription food, uh, medication, anti-inflammatories again and again and again, about every month we'd have flare ups. After a couple of years, like got pretty obvious that it just wasn't working. And we just happened to stumble. Uh, I think it was across a like bulldog Facebook group. And there was a discussion about this. And someone is like, get your dog onto raw food. Didn't know what it was, did some research. Um, and just to clarify for the audience as well, raw food diet is not uh, just raw meat. Um, a raw food diet is a balanced raw food diet it's kind of simulates prey diet so there's a portion of raw meat but there's organ meats there's bone there's also some vegetables in there to uh, kind of simulating the stomach contents of the prey animal so they get everything we decided to switch because why not um, we had to try something and after a few months it was very obvious that it was working wow we're no longer going to the vet with flare-ups. We, in fact, didn't go for about, after two months of raw food, we didn't go for about 11 months. Mm. And um, it was really interesting because at that time, uh, raw food was kind of just starting in, in Australia as a thing. Like there was only one product that I could, I could buy. Um, and But we saw significant, very obvious results. The coat was good. Didn't notice so much in behavior issue, in behavior, but... I do know that like just, you know, from a common sense perspective, a lot of the products that are out there are just full of rubbish, full of carbohydrates, fillers, preservatives, and they can sit on the shelf for three years. If you fed yeah. a human that food, you wouldn't do well mentally or physically. And um, so a, a most close to nature diet, um, in my opinion, and I've shared this with other fr um, friends who have dogs with skin conditions, and they have seen those results. So I don't have, there's no, I'm not speaking from a scientific perspective. Sure. The anecdotal, but I certainly uh, am a big fan of that because I've seen the results in, in, in my experience. Mm. So, um, but m about that more, that is more a, a, a question for like a, a canine nutritionist. Sure. And this topic does come up and I just want to stay in my lane. 
because uh, I, I, it's not my field of expertise, but it's something I'm passionate about. Yeah. But if you're interested, I recommend a book called The Forever Dog, and mm-hmm. it was published in 2021 by a vet speaking out about the ties between major pet food companies and the education in the vet education space, mm. and um, which is kind of explains why vets are selling processed food a lot of the time. But that's shifting. There are more and more like holistic vets that are opening up that are aware of raw food, are accepting of raw food. Like at that time, my vet was against the raw food diet, it was straight up like, no, it's not okay to do this. There's risks. Um, and so, you know, I could see that there was conflict there with, with the practice of raw feeding and dietary recommendation. But I certainly have seen a shift in that happen. So um, that, that's really good. And that book suggests you will add years to your dog's life by avoiding giving them a fresh food diet, avoiding exposure to to chemicals and pesticides and lots of outdoor activity. Um, yeah. Uh, are, there, are there any resources uh, apart from obviously going to the butcher and getting raw meat, um, which sounds like a, a perfectly viable and probably the most direct resource you can get, but are there any resources or products that you can get that kind of emulate that? Um, that end product um, yeah. on the market in yeah. Australia? Absolutely. Um, so if you go to like any pet store and you just look, ask for their like raw food products, like um, it's it's actually called BARF, B-A-R-F, Biologically Appropriate Raw Food. And it's... Oh, um, I was and trying to figure be, out what that stood for. <laughs> that's what that is, yeah. So yeah. it's... Uh, and you want a a balanced raw food so something that has so go the only issue with going firstly the best you can do is make it yourself in terms of standard you're controlling the quality of everything and it's all going to be pretty much human grade the only issue is you need to put bone in there um you and i had i don't i did this for a bit i had a big chopping block and it would take me four hours on a Saturday to process enough meat to feed, to feed my dog for the next mm. few weeks. It's just too time consuming. So, um, but without kind of going into like specific brands, there's um, yeah, there, there, there are a range of products that you could go, you go to, but, but I did want to clarify, it's not just giving your dog raw kangaroo. Cause if you do that, they're not getting all of the other benefits from the other parts of the animal. Mm, got yeah. It. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. So it's your final question about um, the kind of d- dominance theory and kind of other, you know, uh, and, and, and pack theory and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, wanna, I, I guess I want to start this, this delicate conversation because uh, we're getting into territory around different styles of training. Mm-hmm. And that is a very, um, it's a minefield. Um, mm. And there are, there will be, there are different practices of dog training all the way from dominance theory on one end, uh, which is very much about um, not, there's not so heavy on, on positive reinforcement, or if it is, it's just in the form of praise, but there's very much an expectation. If your dog makes a bad decision, you'll correct it. And often those corrections are physical on, on the other end, um, is is a positive only and force free where there's no force used on the dog you're only teaching your dog behaviors using positive reinforcement Um, and managing behavioral issues is done in other ways but Mm. not specifically by punishing the dog for making those bad decisions Um, the process is very different now i actually sit uh, to the left of the the middle, so let's say to the positive side of the middle. I, I kind of describe myself as a positive first balance trainer. And that's where I absolutely am a big fan of positive reinforcement. I That's how I teach dogs behaviors with positive reinforcement. Um, but I also set boundaries with dogs and I will use uh different ways to different methods to correct a dog for behavior or to let a dog know um to to basically to punish a dog and punishment has a really um 
has a negative connotation. It feels like I don't want to punish my dog. But if any action that you take that's going to decrease the frequency of a behavior is a punishment. And a punishment may be as simple as like taking your attention or the toy away from a dog. That's a form of punishment. Um, whereas communicating with your dog verbally in a firm tone is a form of punishment. So is giving a correction on a leash or whatever. Yes. So, so yeah. So my, if you, I kind of, in the course of the training with me, and I'm constantly telling this to my clients, if you are punishing your dog a lot or frequently, something's gone wrong. We mm. want our dog to participate in training. We want them to want to be with us. If we're just punishing our dog for making bad decisions, I think um, that's not, well, it's just not how I practice dog training and it's not where I've seen results. And I have tried that in the past and that's not what I found was most effective for me. There are people out there who find that effective and that's also okay. And similarly with um, uh, positive reinforcement only, there are people who subscribe to that practice and that's amazing. That's great. Mm. Achieve the results with whatever skill set then that's that's wonderful i'm not i'm not against i'm not really against anything but i um i certainly know that there's like very strong opinions in in those fields and there's like camps and it becomes quite it's just it's rife on the internet you know yeah yeah so yeah we uh Uh, sorry i'm taking over here man i'm so sorry please please go no, no. I, I well, look. I, I just wanted to uh, chime in and ask a question, which uh, it's really in relation to something that happened in in our family over the last probably happened a couple of months ago now, where uh, our, my my parents' uh, dog was uh, seventeen years old, and uh, she was experiencing a lot of frailty, difficulty, incontinence. Um, and we eventually came to a point where we felt like her, her life quality was not at a point where she was. And this was a very confusing time for me personally. I've never had to make a decision like this mm. to actively go to a vet and decide to end the life of mm. a family member. Mm-hmm. And it was a really traumatic experience uh for for everybody involved um i suppose my question to you is which i i tend to think is going to be a case-to-case scenario but have you experienced times where you've had to uh be an active participant in ending a family member's life uh being a dog um how do you know as a layman Mm when that when the time has come yeah that's um that's a really challenging question to answer um what i what i can firstly i'm it's i'm sorry that it's such a hard thing and i'm sorry you you had to go through that uh it's it's something that really like most dog owners have to go through at some point because we do have that option for dogs um whereas obviously we we don't well, that's that's kind of changing now um it's it's quite confronting uh to deal with that and then you're right you're 100 right as i said at the start of it is a family member um but yeah i've had to make that decision on on two occasions um it was incredibly challenging um and i really the the process for me was really it's all about quality of life for the dog and really trying to separate my well-being from the dog's well-being. And this is something that comes up a lot in, in training, not on in the topic of, of kind of euthanasia, but about when we choose to give our dog affection, right? We love it, right? Who is that affection serving? Is it serving us or is it serving our dog? Mm. Because a lot of people love giving their dog affection the problem is affection is a reward it's a reward for whatever behavior your dog is giving them that moment in time or immediately before that so um, a lot of behaviors that people are trying to fix are behaviors that they're reinforcing Mm. because they're giving affection to their dog 
at the wrong time. Like, why is their dog jumping? Because when they come home, they get excited, their dog jumps on them, and they give them a cuddle. Well, that is teaching your dog to jump. I'm not saying don't give your dog affection. Absolutely not. I love giving my dog affection. But I recognize that giving your dog affection is a teaching moment, right? Yeah. It's a teaching moment. Interesting. So choose your moments. Is your Do you want your dog to be jumping up at people? No. So just wait. Just hold off on your needs till your dog gives you a behavior they want and then go and reward them and your like let your moment out on the dog at that time. So Paul, coming back to your to your question, interesting is like I have seen dogs existing in excruciating pain with uh, psychological and physical pain that are suffering every day. They are hearing things, they are clearly disturbed and distressed by everyday life, but the owner can't face the challenging decision of letting that dog go because of their well-being. And I really, this is where we, we kind of have to separate. If you were in that dog's position, um, and this maybe comes down to a person's belief system, and really, like, there really is no right answer here. What would you, what would you want? What is that person's quality of life? What is that dog's quality of life? Um, for a dog that is in so much arthritic pain that they are aggressive to people, they don't want anyone to come over. That means you have to start isolating them from whenever you have guests. What is what life is that for a dog? Yeah. Um, and that's that's I'm talking about my own experience. Our last dog, aggressive behavior. And he's because we have kids in our home and, and, and kids are coming over. It was like he was becoming increasingly isolated. And so the vet was really helpful in just being like, look, you can go down a path of pain management, but it's not going to like really, it, it will ease things somewhat, but it's not going to guarantee any quality of life. In fact, it's, it's probably only marginally going to assist because you're still going to need to take all these extra precautions. You're still going to need to isolate your dog that became an obvious decision that like his life had come to an end and I, I didn't want him to go down that path. Um, so, so for me, I think it's just, and the advice I give to anyone is like, really, really make sure that you're making a decision when you separate your needs from your dog's needs. And, and what would you do? What would you want if you were your dog? Because the idea of, you know, just, I'm just going to cuddle my dog until till the moment they die. If your dogs, some dogs don't even like affection, particularly if they're sore and old. It's um, it's hard. It's hard. I don't know if that's answered your question, but no, no, it it does, and it's a it's a great little kind of um, criteria, I suppose, to be able to uh, live, uh, to to be able to develop those those last stages of of life. Mm. By so, um, I th that I think what you just spoke about there, um, you know where where you're actually only showing affection for our own selfish needs as opposed to um, when you should. It touches on something that um, at least Siobhan and I feel very strongly about, and I recognize that as a professional, um, you know, you want to be as diplomatic as possible here. So I hope I'm not loading you up with a contentious question here, but we we uh, we noticed a lot that um, uh, when the lockdowns occurred, Heaps of people were getting beagles because they're very cute puppies. Obviously, we're um, quite biased in that regard. Um, but uh, when the lockdown stopped, a lot of people were giving them away, and um, we we, yeah. we we only ever uh, adopt. Um, we recognise some of the behavioural issues. I'm not trying to virtue signal here at all, but I just uh, the, the the question that I had for you here is because we we all get a dog for selfish reasons to begin with, you know, I, I can't think how many people would get a dog just to help that dog. Obviously that would play a role in it, but we have dogs because we want dogs, you know, Yeah. how much of your uh, role as a behavioral trainer comes down to actually discussing how well the actual dog aligns with the individual's lifestyle. Does that come into it at all or? Yeah. So that's, that is a very good question. And it's not something 
that I speak to directly with sure. people for the simple reason that if someone has gotten a uh, working line German shepherd that is designed to be out with a police officer or herding in the field for 10 hours a day and they're wanting a dog to cuddle on the couch, um, my job is not to to point out you've made a, a, a terrible decision. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my job is to support. My job is to support the person in the situation they're in. They've made that decision. I, I'm not making any judgments there. And often, like I've made, as I've made uneducated decisions. No one knows until they get help, right? Yeah. So I understand it's easy to make those those mistakes or the, those choices. Um, you know, like, you know, a lot of people get working dogs, like they'll get Kelpies and Collies and all this stuff that I don't know if you've ever seen what these dogs do on a farm. And mm. then they're living in, they're living in apartments, getting a half hour, 45 minute walk in the morning and a half hour at night. But, you know, it, when you see what they're supposed to do and what they're doing, it can, it's challenging. So yeah. what I do is I actually, just, I, I invite people to like, I, I say like you're, I, I, I'm not, I don't joke about the needs of the dog. I'm like, you have a working dog. It has high needs. Yeah. So you need to be giving at least this much exercise. And this is how we're going to do it. Cause we, a lot of people give their dog lots of physical exercise, but um, and think that, well, if their dog's tired, that's fine. But what's missed is the mental load. Mm -hmm. Most dogs are not getting nearly enough mental stimulation. They're getting heaps of exercise. Most people actually that I deal with are doing a pretty good job of exercising their dog, um, but they're totally lacking in mental stimulation. Yeah. It's just all this just kind of free running around, dog pulls them on the walk or the runs, but it's mindless. When we start adding a mental load to the dog, that's when we start to see that fulfillment come in. They just relax. We're giving them activities that they were bred to do. They have an outlet that nourishes them and they can actually switch off when they come home. Mm. So this kind of freed fulfillment side of you with beagles, I would definitely be recommending doing activities where they have to use their nose to find things. Yeah. So, you know, everything just teaching them like to to find their food let them scavenge put them in the put them inside and in sit get them to wait go hide their food in the garden or an enclosed area and then release them with a specific word this is like go and find your food <laughs> when the game we play is go find it it's just funny you said that yeah yeah, yeah, perfect. So that find it game is brilliant. I've been doing that with my dog. And she's not a scent dog by any means, but I've developed her sense of smell. So now when we go out and we do stuff in the bush, I'll get her to sit somewhere and then I'll walk, come back a different route and then tell her to go find it. And for like 25 minutes, she's just like nose to the ground doing this stuff and it's exhausting for her brain and it's a great activity, but certainly it's a great activity for, for dogs with scent drive. Mm, mm, awesome. Awesome. Cool. Love it. Uh, what do you reckon, uh, Polly? Yeah, yeah. yeah am amazing. At some stage, Tommy, we're going to have to let Jordan go. Are you okay <laughs> with that? Ah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to put up with it, I think. <laughs> I'm um, gonna now have to recancel him about withdrawal from you, Jordan. Yeah, this is really good. I love like I'm so passionate about this. I love I could talk, uh, you know, dog stuff all day. And and really like my primary passion is teaching people. This mm. is for me. This is greatest joy is like sharing my experience, my education um, with people so that they can have a better and more enriching experience with their dog, and also just to make their dogs their best selves. Um, so that for me, it's this, this is, this is the great joy. The working with the dogs is awesome, uh, and is just, is unreal, but the people side, that's, that's my, that's, that's actually my primary passion. It's amazing. You can Love see it. the passion that you have in the way you educate and talk about, uh, things. And uh, it's incredible that you're, you're adding so much value, not just to, and, and this is something I've learned in our discussion, not just to, to, to humans' lives, but to dogs' lives and the value yeah. that they have uh, every moment that they walk this turf, which is pretty incredible. Um, speaking of educating, tell us a little bit about where people can find you online and also in person for, for in-person dog training. 
So at the moment, um, my process is you can jump on my Instagram channel, which is Chilled and Fulfilled, or my website, chilledandfulfilled.com, and you can book in an assessment call. And that's just like a 30 minute call where I'll chat to you about your dog and how and if or how I can how I can help you. Um, in the in there's like instructions on what to do and you'll watch a little video and fill out a questionnaire and I give you an indication on prices depending on on the circumstance. And then that's cool. that's basically it. Um, but I am going to be launching an app um, this year, which uh, is going to allow me to reach more people. Um, where I'll have just videos with content um, and courses on how to help your dog for a range of different problems. We're very excited to to launch that later in the year. Amazing. 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 Love it. Mate, thank you so sure. much. That was awesome. That was bloody awesome. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, really appreciate it. Happy to chat anytime. And yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Awesome. Guys, thank, you so, thank you so much for listening to the show. Sorry for interrupting. Sorry about the internet, but we got there in the end. And uh, Paulie and I will speak to you very soon. Bye.